Right. Thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, sorry, we're getting started a few minutes late. Um, I'm just going to let, wait a couple seconds while everyone trickles in. Great, it looks like we have a good amount of people showing up today. So I'm um, gonna go ahead and get started. This is the third green energy series presentation. Um, the topic for today is solar beyond the roof. Um, so solar and other places and other, other types of solar. Um, this series is a series of free educational webinars that was created um, by our lovely volunteers that are amazing and put a lot of work into this. Um, Edward Louis, who I will um, introduce more fully later, he is the presenter for this topic, and then lots of help from Carrie Booth and Denise Roy uh, and Linda Barnes and Mark. So um, thank you all, lots to you all. So um, this uh, series is sponsored by and supported by Solar Oregon. Solar Oregon is a nonprofit focused on expanding solar in Oregon through education, outreach, community um, building and advocacy. And so as part of that, we do regular how to go solar and storage presentations. Um, they're usually also webinars. So if you're interested, um, you can check those out. We do tours, um, of solar in buildings and agriculture in different locations. Um, we uh, conduct solarized campaigns, which are campaigns to get whole neighborhoods to go solar together. And then we also like to focus on peer to peer education and connecting people who are interested in going solar with um, people who have already gone solar. Coming up, we have a tour and showcase of Green Sea Departments. Um, on January 11th at 6 p.m. So in, in the evening after the workday, you can go and check out this really innovative um, uh, housing complex. It's an uh, um, apartment building. It's completely zero energy. Um, and it also has a lot of focus on building community, being affordable, um, and has a lot of um, innovative kind of ways they approach the design and also kind of the business model of this apartment building. So I really recommend going and there'll be a panel discussion and tour of the of the building. Um, we are a member based nonprofit. So um, we like to thank all of our members for supporting our work. If you are not already a member, we really encourage you to join. Um, you get discounts to our solar winery tour and go zero tour each year um, and get to support solar in Oregon. So this is uh, a link that you can use to um, become a member and donate. You can also follow us on social media and Eventbrite at Solar Oregon to um, get the most up to date events and webinars that we are hosting. Throughout this presentation, we encourage you to put all your questions into the Q&A box. This allows us to have it all in one spot so Edward can answer those questions throughout the presentation. Um, you can also use the chat box to communicate with people, but we ask that you put questions in the Q&A box so they're all in one spot. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be made available on Solar Oregon's YouTube channel afterwards. Um, we are going to launch a quick poll that we would appreciate if you filled out really quickly. This helps us understand who we're reaching through these webinars. Um, so we um, understand how we can get more people in the future um, from, uh, um, from the, a wide array of locations and, and um, we wanna reach all of Oregon. So this helps us do that.
This is great. It looks like we have two international attendees, which is pretty cool. Um, also have lots of people from the coast and Eastern Oregon, uh, a couple from another state. So it's cool to see we're, we're getting people from all over to come learn about this. All right, I'll give one more minute to fill out that poll and then we'll get into more, more interesting stuff. Great. Thank you all for filling that out. Um, so our speaker for today um, and for all of the Green Energy Series presentations is the wonderful Edward Louis. Edward is passionate, passionate about residential energy efficiency technologies, building assemblies and housing typologies. Edward works as a building and energy efficiency research engineer at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the Building Systems and Technology Integration Group. He works on research projects related to heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, high performance windows, and remote quality assurance via contractors taking photos of critical details and reporting test results. Before joining PNNL, he worked as a residential raider slash verifier inspector um, for three above code energy efficiency programs in the greater Portland, Oregon and Southwest Washington area. Outside of work, Edward has been working on building a super energy efficient off grid all electric tiny house on a trailer to gain first hand construction skills and experiences with building and executing high performance envelopes, installing solar PV and batteries and more. When complete, Edward will live in the tiny house to test whether it is possible to live off grid with the designed energy system and use it also as a job site trailer to oversee the construction and middle density housing projects. So Edward, I'm going to let you take it away um, with the meat of this presentation. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, just want to start off this presentation with a disclaimer. Um, the, the presentation that I'm giving is uh, just my views and um, the facts and information I've researched. They don't necessarily represent the uh, opinions or the position of uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, my employer, or Department of Energy, or necessarily Solar Oregon. Um, so just a disclaimer I need to give out. Um, so next slide. So um, this, the title of this presentation is Solar Beyond the Roof. And um, there's a few take home points that if you uh, kind of forget 80% of this presentation um, and only remember a few things, um, the, the things I want you to remember is um, if you can make solar panels do double or triple duty as either a roofing material or a shading material or a water shedding material, um, that is awesome if you can make it do these double or triple duties. So that's point number one to take home. And point number two to take home is the startup cost of solar is not trivial. So therefore, the more panels you install for that startup cost, you know, the, the, it, the your startup cost will get spread out across more panels. Um, your solar system will cost less and you're going to get more bang for your buck. And so if you can, if you, if you run out of roof space or you can't put them on your roof, put them somewhere else on, on your property, a, 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 a solar beyond the roof so that you can install more panels for the same startup cost. Um, that's great. So those are the two main points. And we're going to go through some of the applications on how you can install solar beyond the roof. Um, and here's a list of some of the things we'll cover, whether it be carports or pergolas or using as a siding or um, in more commercial applications, um, solar on parking lots to shade parking lots or shade sidewalks. Um, and we're also gonna talk about like a little bit bigger scale, like community solar, when if you uh, don't have any good siting on your own property, even if you go beyond the roof. So we'll kind of cover all that stuff. Uh, next slide. So um, why solar beyond the roof? Well, one of the primary reasons for doing solar beyond the roof is if you don't have a roof that's good for solar. And it's not just necessarily small homes that have roofs that aren't good for solar. You can have mansion sized homes that have roof geometry that's not good for solar. And I've seen it in many homes um, that are humongous. And so here's one example uh, of a roof that with really complex geometry and none of it is really necessarily good for solar. Um, 
and so uh the, it yeah there's many risks where it's just not cost effective to do solar on the roof and so you have to start thinking beyond the roof next slide and so here's a you know one one example of a more modest house that has a roof where they were only able to fit only a few panels on the roof one because you know it's a hip roof and then two they had a chimney they needed to work around and so um the the solar panels um they had to keep away from the chimney because well you know this as the sun tracks around the sky it will cast a shadow using that chimney and if that shadow hits the panel um you're going to end up with very little production so they had to kind of clear the space around the chimney um and in the end they were only able to install a few panels and so it's like well um given the startup cost of doing solar the you know the permitting the electrical work the inverter um all those fixed costs of doing solar and you're only able to install a handful of panels you know your system is not going to produce that much benefit for the amount of bucks you're putting in um so uh, that's an example and so what one way to evaluate how good is your solar on your roof versus somewhere else on your property is to uh, use a device called a solar pathfinder which is what we're showing uh, that device looks like on the right hand side it's this like plastic dome um and it's got this sheet of, of paper that's specially designed uh, with these curves on it and you take a picture of the plastic dome and the plastic dome had creates uh, captures the reflections at that point where you're trying to take the survey and you can see around the edge of the um plastic dome you see like the the houses and the trees and stuff and when where those houses and trees intersects the curved lines on that piece of paper inside this dome will show you the hours of the day and the month of the year when that panel will be shaded. And so if you have a site where you have a significant shading that encroaches on that solar window, then that that site is not necessarily a great site for um, for for solar. And so then you know you want to survey other places, that could be beyond the roof. And if it's a better site, then that may be a more cost effective location uh, for installing solar. Uh, next next uh, slide. So, well, what are some of the logical places beyond the roof that one might want to install solar? Well, one is um, a lot of homes have driveways. And it's because I guess America is a very drive, personal vehicle centric country. So we have a lot of cars, personal vehicles, a lot of driveways, and um, a lot of Americans fill their garage with stuff to the point that they can't park their car in their garage, even if they have a garage. So they park it on the driveway. And a lot of these driveways are exposed. And so the car is you know, getting beat down with UV rays. Um, if it's a snowy place, um, you, know, it's, you have to clear snow off your car in order to drive in the morning. Um, if you live in a hot part of the uh, state or the country, you know, the, your heart car is exposed to extremely high temperatures. Well, you know, that's not exactly that great for comfort and not exactly that great for your car's paint. Um, but, you know, this place is generally nice and open. And so installing a solar carport uh, might be a really good idea. I mean, you, you do the survey in this area with that um, solar pathfinder from the previous slide. Um, you might find this to be a quite a decent location to put solar. And when you install a carport, um, generally you're going to go with the cheapest and easiest and simplest roof possible. And usually that means it is a mono pitch roof like this one. Um, and so, you know, this is a very easy roof design um, that makes it very easy to install solar panels. Um, and you gain the benefits of not only the panels being easy and cheap to install. Uh, and so therefore, and then also like, you know, the the, the cost of, in, of building this carport to begin with has a certain cost to it. And that cost is generally not that much because, you know, it's a really simple structure. And so therefore, you know, if you look at the, the cost of doing these panels on the roof versus the cost of actually building this structure and then putting the panels on top, um, 
you might be only talking about a few thousand dollars more. And if you're able to install a lot of panels, then that cost gets spread out by a lot of panels. And bam, in the end, it's kind of a wash. Um, and and you, if you get better generation on top of that, then it's definitely a wash in terms of um, you know the additional cost of doing a carport versus uh, doing it on the roof. And um, so, and so some of the other cool things that you can do um, and get a lot of benefit from when you're doing it on like a carport is if you install bifacial panels, then generally the pavement of your driveway is concrete. It's a pretty ref hot, uh, light colored reflective surface. Your car may be relatively light color and reflective. And so all this reflected light um, is great if you, you are able to install bifacial panels. And, and if, if you've seen a previous presentation, I've said um, bifacial panels are now basically exactly the same cost as monofacial panels. And so if you can get bifacial panels and get the extra bifacial gains out of it, hey, do that. And so you get some better efficiency on your panels um, and the panels stay cooler because, you know, you got tons of air cooling in, on the backside. Um, and that cooling also helps give you an extra few percent of efficiency. Um, so I think this is a great win-win, you know, like I said, like you, you get a free roof for your car and you get solar. Um, so that's that's awesome. Um, so that's one option. Uh, let's take a look at the next slide and look at some other things. And uh, here's an, another example. Okay, so if you have a backyard uh, and you want to have a little backyard hangout spot, uh, you want to install a roof because you know maybe you're on the uh, west side of the Cascade Mountains and it rains all the time. Um, and so you may want a roof. Well, okay, let's do a solar pergola. If you're gonna do a roof. Why don't you do the roof of the solar panels? Um, usually these, you know, hangout spots in the backyard, you're not interested in a roof that's necessarily 100% watertight, but, you know, 98% waterproof is good enough, okay? So, you know, you don't necessarily even need to have a roof below the solar panels. You can just use the panels and put them together and you'll end up with a surface that's 98% watertight. Um, and... Uh, you know, it, it could be very expensive to, you know, run conduit to, depending on, you know, this place of your backyard or that, you know, you're interested in installing this pergola in. Um, and so one of the great benefits of solar panels is um, you can do uh, do the system off grid even. So like um, nowadays, yeah, there's a market uh, called solar generators, um, but basically what it is, is an all in one uh, solar charge controller, um, MPPT, uh, battery, inverter. Um, they even have like, you know, wireless chargers for your phone built on top of this units and stuff. You buy one of those, stick it somewhere underneath this pergola, and plug in your solar panels, that solar battery generator thing, and bam, you have a really fast turnkey solution uh, for getting power to this back out, backyard hangout spot. Um, and you don't even have to p deal with the cost of permits necessarily, because this is a often considered a non-dwelling structure. Um, I believe there's something like, you know, if you build it below the height of your garage or below like maybe like a certain height, you don't even need structural permits. Uh, but certainly if it's not connected to the grid um, or connected to your electric panel, you don't need an electric permit. Um, so, you know, this this a, a neat thing that you can do. Um, and if you hang out there and do enough cooking on electricity, um, you know, this this can offset some of your, uh, you know, cooking energy cost. Um, so, yeah, that, that's an option. Uh, but if you were to run conduit and connect it to your main house and do net metering, uh, that is another option. But, you know, you have to explore the cost of uh, running that conduit, you know, depending on the distance. Uh, next slide. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, let's actually put some numbers to some of these costs. So, uh, you know, I, this is some numbers I did for a solar pergola for Dignity Village. Uh, Dignity Village is a uh, site uh, for um, homes for the homeless. And um, they have this area, this common area, and they were looking at exploring the cost of building a pergola that they can then like put some barbecues underneath there, some tables and chairs and you know, some 
place protected area for you know the the, the residents to hang out and eat and socialize with each other. And uh, you know, I ran some numbers, and uh, there it's the Dignity Village is um, a site that's over a paved asphalt. Basically, it's a parking lot that's been reutilized as a community of uh, homes now. And so they didn't want to necessarily drill or dig it underneath that asphalt. So this pergola that I specced out for them uh, would be held down by uh, these pallet sized water tanks called IVC tanks. And so they'll get held down that way to keep the wind from blowing around. Um, but anyways, this pergola that is um, uh, 8kW uh, with including uh, 15kW uh, kilowatt hours of batteries because you know uh, it may or may not be tied to the grid and probably not tied to the grid um, that total cost is about 17 grand and you know it, it, even without any sort of rebates or credits or anything like that the system would pay for itself in 13.8 uh, years which is uh, well below the cost of panels well below the cost uh, even below the uh, the lifespan of the batteries um, the modern day batteries have a lifespan somewhere around 15 to 19 years um, and could last even longer, but you know, they've done accelerate wear test and they're, they think that they'll last somewhere around 15 to 19 years. So anyways, uh, the system will pay, pay for itself before any of the equipment wears out. Um, and uh, you know, you gain the additional benefits of, you know, a hangout spot that's, you know, covered and protected. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in some numbers, there's there's some numbers. Um, next slide. All right, solar as siding. I've always thought that this is a great idea. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in retrofit um, because currently you are not able to buy panels in every single size under the sun. Um, you know, panels are typically available in like the 300-ish watt size, the 400-ish watt size, and the 500-ish watt size. And um, those sizes don't necessarily Tetris well with, you know, where your windows and doors are in your house. And so, you know, beauty is an eye of the beholder. Some people might think that upper right photo is beautiful. I think it looks a little strange. Um, so therefore, like in a retrofit situation, it might be difficult to execute without the system looking ugly. Um, but in new construction, uh, it is entirely possible to design the building around a certain sized solar panel so that it tetrises very well with the windows and doors, uh, which is what the building uh, in the lower right is showing. You know, it's perfectly tetris, and I think that building looks very beautiful. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I looked into the, what is the cost of doing solar as siding? I thought it would be, you know, much more expensive than siding, but it turns out not. Um, solar panels, just the material cost, you know, you, a modern day solar panel divided out by the square footage of the, each panel size, you're talking about, about $12 a square foot. And when you compare that to the cost of other siding material, um, it, competes very well. And none of the other solar siding materials will generate electricity for you. Um, solar panels do. So from a material standpoint, it's cost competitive and you get the benefit of the energy generation. So, you know, I think, you know, in new construction, you know, it, it, it may be very worth your while to, you know, have your architect, you know, Tetris the windows on the south side or the west side or of the house that's you know ex gets very good sun, uh, so that the windows and, uh, and doors will mesh with the solar panels and look seamless. Um, now, uh, I've I've reached out to you know city building code officials to ask you know what will it take to you know permit a building that has solar panels as siding. And I've gotten an answer. They said, well, we require the racking manufacturer, a letter from the racking manufacturer and a letter from the solar panel manufacturer that is stamped by one of their engineers or if your panel or your racking company can't provide such a letter, an independent engineer will need to do some analysis and have a stamped uh, piece, a letter 
for the code uh, review folks to approve this use of solar panels as siding because it's considered what is an alternative technology. And so, you know, it needs a, a third party to okay this. But other than that, they're okay with it. So that's great. And then the last bullet point is um, it, it never gets covered by snow. So if you're in a snowy part of, you know, the state or in the country um, and your panels on your roof get covered, if you got solar panels on your siding, you still get some generation. So I think that's really quite good. Um, you know, there's a, a question that came up about uh, generation compared to a properly sloped roof. Um, I think it really depends, um, but uh, it's it's sort of an irrelevant question because like, you know, if the panels itself is so cost competitive with other siding materials, even if it's like, you know, only half or 40% or even 30% of the generation, if you compare it to a, you know, an optimally sloped panel on a roof, um, this is like, you know, the cherry on top. Like it, it it's <laughs> anything is better than nothing um, <laughs> on the energy side, because like there's just the material of the siding is, is so cost competitive, other siding materials. Um, next, next slide. Now, in the previous slide, we said, well, you know, if, if you don't Tetris it perfectly, it'll look ugly. And that's true with today's panels, um, but there are companies, there's a handful of companies, the most notable and I guess the uh, well-known one is Mitrix. Um, and they're making panels that have a facer that allows the panel to blend in with existing siding materials. And so there's in the far left picture is an example of that uh, panel of a facer um, that allows it to blend in with brick. And um, it's pretty new technology. They've gotten it down. They've gotten it, the science of it down so that it's not just like a bench top product, but rather one that they can produce at full scale. Um, but there's not a lot of information about how many of these panels they've shipped. And there's definitely no pricing information that uh, has been circulated. And so it's a technology to keep in mind and to keep track of, um, to watch it develop. Uh, certainly, I think that there is some energy efficiency penalties for having this facer. I mean, it just makes sense. But uh, maybe the penalty is small enough that um, it's, it's still producing a decent amount of energy. And if they can get the price, like I said, very competitive with existing um, siding products, then like, hey, it, maybe you don't really care about the efficiency being like the most optimal possible, you know, if you're just getting the energy as like, you know, the cherry on top, uh, you know, benefit. So... Um, something to keep in mind. I'm going to keep keep track of this technology. I think it's really cool. Uh, next slide. And so this solar using solar panels as window awnings. This is something I think is a really great idea. Um, the win windows are a magical thing. They are one of the few elements of your building. First of all, windows and the glazing of your uh, of your of your building is absolutely the worst performing part of your entire building shell. So, if you consider the building shell being, you know, the 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 slab, the insulated slab to the ground, or the insulated, you know, floor to the crawl space, and the insulated roof to the you know to the outside in your walls, you know, this six sided box of your house. The whole the windows are the absolute worst performing part of this building shell. But at the same time, it is the only part of the building shell that if you angle the sun right at the right time of the year, you actually get energy gains. And so, but that that energy gain at the right time of the year, uh, that benefit is then lost by the additional energy it takes to uh, manage, you know, the additional, the undesirable energy gains or loss of that window. Um, and so one of the things that you can really do to mitigate the undesirable 
energy gains uh, through those windows is with an exterior awning that shades the window um, from the sun uh, during the, like the hot summer times when you really would not like that direct solar energy gain through your windows. And so um, awnings are often done without solar panels. Um, but if you put solar panels as a window awning, it is the, like, the perfect place to put them because typically these areas are not very well shaded. So your panels are producing, you know, on, in full sun. Um, and uh, a lot of windows are sized so that the, like I said, the 300-ish or 400-ish watt panels are a great fit for, for, um, for these solar panels. And if you have smaller windows that, you know, are that even the 300-ish watt panel is too big, then you can move to, you know, uh there there's lots of panels made for like the rv industry and those panels are much smaller and i think those panels would uh, uh you know fit very well on windows um i have a solar panel awning on my tiny house i had to install one because the sun coming through my sliding glass door without the uh this awning would overheat my tiny house and so i installed one and uh it, it works great um, as far as racking for this, these um, window awnings, there are a number of manufacturers that make engineered, stamped, approved um, racking equipment to hold up these solar panels when used as window awnings. And so you don't have to necessarily custom make something and then somehow get it approved by the billing code. Um, but in areas where it's, you know, there you don't need necessarily building code officials to approve of your solar window awning. Um, you can build your own uh, racking, uh, which is what I did for my tiny house. My tiny house is, does not qualify as a structure that is uh, requires building code reviews um, and inspections. And so I, I built my own window awning uh, track and uh, hinge system. Uh, but uh, there's this picture in the lower right hand corner that somebody also uh, similar to what I did, uh, built a window awning racking system made out of wood. So next slide. Um, okay, so uh, going back to that kind of thought process of like, okay, well, trying to get solar to do double or triple duty. Well, you know, there's a lot of interest in getting the glazing, the glass part of windows to not only you know protect the glazing from you know wind pressures and water, but still allowing you to have a view to the outside. Um, can we integrate solar panels, a, a photovoltaic uh, material, into the glass uh, so that you know when you put it into a window, the window can generate electricity? And this technology has been researched for multiple decades now. Um, and I think the technology, the research has accelerated in recent years. Um, and so, you know, there, there were, were every few weeks, I see some news about, um, these panels getting, uh, better in terms of its optical clarity, um, some sort of cost reduction measure. Um, but despite these news sound bites, um, this is technology that is not necessarily ready for you to buy today. Uh, so it, it could that could change in a year or two, I think. Um, but is if you're interested in this technology, definitely keep an eye out for it because it is rapidly uh, changing. And the the rapid changes is in the areas of price reduction, you know, increasing the transparency of the solar panels while still maintaining good energy production. Um, and here's an example from the University of Oregon where um, they've, this is, you know, technology from a few years ago where, you know, the solar cell clarity is not very good. Um, but, you know, in this case, they may want actually to have some, you know, reduction in optical transmissivity because, you know, in this atrium area, if it was perfectly clear glass, they may actually have much higher air conditioning loads. And now that the solar panels are providing some 
reduction, that transmissivity, um, you know, their air conditioning loads are reduced. Uh, but you know they're they're able to produce energy for this glass. So I mean I think I think that's really cool. Um, so there there's a picture of the technology, um, and there's many different institutions that have experimented with this glass. And so this this building is not the only one where uh, this technology has been installed. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then solar panels to shade parking lots. Um, this is a great idea. Um, it's such a great idea that France passed a law that by 2028, parking lots with more than 80 spaces will be required to install solar covering that covers at least 50% of the parking lots. Um, in the US, we have no sight of such policy coming into effect. Um, but someone did a study that uh, if we covered all the U.S. parking lots with solar panels, we would have a capacity, solar generating capacity increase that is three times what the total installed capacity is currently from 2021. And so we have a lot of parking lot in America. And so these, these parking lot areas are typically free of shade. Um, they're already paved. Um, so, you know, we're not displacing land for, you know, just to put solar panels. It's or the parking lot space is already displaced for parking. Um, and um, as more vehicles uh, be become electric vehicles, um, I think that, you know, the solar panels generating energy to help, you know, offset some of the, uh, the, the, the grid um impacts of electric vehicles. I think that's a win-win. Um, and I think retailers need to really start thinking about um, not only the energy benefits, but the increased revenue in shopping. So um, most electric vehicles take 30 minutes or multiple hours to charge, even on level two or higher. And so, you know, as a person who drives an electric vehicle, they may be inclined to shop longer just knowing that, you know, it's going to take a while for their car to charge. Um, so um, I think there's some real benefits and opportunities in solar panel um, covering parking lots. Um, and not to mention the, the shade that, um, that comes with being able to walk out to your car in the summer and have it not be baking hot. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I, I hope to see more of this um, type of uh, solar beyond the roof be developed uh, here in the US. Uh, next slide. Um, agrivoltaics, um, gr great idea. Um, if you search on Craigslist or uh, Facebook Marketplace on any day, uh, you may come across solar panels that have been taken off of some project because they're a little bit older, uh, they're smaller, they're less efficient, um, and so those solar panels are being replaced by larger panels that are more efficient. And there, these panels are on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist for pennies on the dollar uh, because, you know, there's not a really good way to get rid of them. And so uh, one of the applications that you could try is to buy them at pennies in the dollar and put it in your backyard and, and use the panels to shade some of your backyard garden plants um, you may find that uh, the, there's significant water savings. And uh, in the summertime, um, some of the crops actually benefit from not having that much sun. Uh, that reduced sun uh, helps re reduce the amount of sunburnt uh, crop that you get. Um, so this might be a win-win, um, especially when you can get the panels for next to nothing. Um, so uh, that's an idea. Uh, next slide. Um, Agrivoltaics is being explored on the large scale uh, by commercial farms. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, farms um, really could benefit from having a second re secondary revenue stream uh, from the sale of energy from these panels. Um, there's significant uh, findings that uh, the panels save not a small amount of water. We're talking about like something like 60 or sometimes some people have even reported like 
close to 90% water savings uh, by having um, their, the, the crops be shaded. Um, and some of the crops actually are much higher quality uh, by not having such strong sun hitting them. And, um, and that's just on the crop side. If you have both uh, 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 plants and animals on the, on the land, um, what you'll find is oftentimes the farm animals will hang out underneath the solar panels because they really like the shade. Um, and in this picture on the far right is a wind turbine. And you can see that the herd of sheep have gone nowhere other than just keep moving along the, the shaded portion of the wind turbine mast. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, if you drive out to the Columbia River Gorge, you will see farms uh, uh, or just open grazing land. And where are the cows hanging out? They'll hang out in the shade of the wind turbines out in the Columbia River, River Gorge. It's a very interesting site. Um, and uh, Oregon is exploring um, this agrivoltaics on a large scale um, at the Oregon State University's uh, Extension Center. They've installed a pretty large system, a 326 kilowatt uh, system, and they're exploring, you know, uh, how much better different crops perform under solar panels. And so they have different test beds of different different types of crops that they're they're testing, um, and uh, we we hope to hear their results in the coming years. Uh, next slide. All right, so. Um, we also have a lot of sidewalks um, all across, uh, you know, our cities, across America. And um, as I use these sidewalks in the wintertime, um, I've always thought, wouldn't it be nice if they were covered? Um, so therefore, then I wouldn't necessarily even like need to bring an umbrella. Um, and so I've, ex I've explored, OK, well, what would it take if I were to install solar panels over the sidewalk? outside my house? And the answer uh, is that, well, Portland Bureau of Transportation actually has an answer. Um, they have requirements that um, if they are less than 15 feet above the sidewalk, then they shall not extend into the sidewalk more than two thirds of the width of the sidewalk. But if it's above 15 feet, then it can cover more than two thirds of the sidewalk. Um, and this on, on top of these rules, um, you still need to get some approvals from Portland Bureau of Transportation before you do this. But it sounds like, you know, from my uh, interactions with PBOT, that it is not a closed case. Like, you know, it, 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 if you wanted to do this, it could be done. Um, and I'm really interested to do this in, in, in my future construction projects around Portland. Um, I, I, I think it'll be nice to have like, you know, the, the kids school bus stop be, you know, underneath a sidewalk that is covered by solar panels so they, they can wait for the school bus, um, and not get wet. I, I think that's, <laughs> that'll be a great idea. Um, and, and so, um, and so let's go to the next slide and I'll, I'll talk about why I think solar covering the tops of the sidewalk is better than necessarily putting the solar panels in the pavement of the sidewalk. And, you know, a, a number of companies over the years um, have raised millions and millions of dollars and tried to gain lots of internet um, uh, news and sound bites for trying to get solar pavement to take off. Um, there's, you may have heard of solar roadways and uh, there now is another company called like Plato that makes solar pavers, um, like shown in the lower right-hand corner photo. Um, in both of the in all these efforts to do solar panel pavers or pavements, um, every single implementation has come out to be, you know, cost overruns and very expensive. Um, France decided to go big and dump, uh, you know, millions of dollars into a pilot. They actually installed a full one kilometer of solar pavement on a road um, in 2016. And by 2018, um, significant sections of that road had to be 
the solar and the significant sections of that road had to be pulled back up and and replaced with regular pavement due to damage from traffic forces. And um, there, that one kilometer of solar roadway cost them $5.2 million. And so you could do a lot more solar uh, for that $5.2 million uh, than one kilometer of one lane. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so my, my thought process on solar pavement is that I, it's difficult to see how it ever be affordable given the harsh conditions that the solar panels would need to withstand. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think the viability of this versus like covering the top with an awning of sidewalks and roads. Um, the, the the previous slide is much more, uh, it's much easier for me to see how that will come down in cost and scale up versus the solar pavement. Um, next slide. So what happens if you've explored all the areas beyond your roof for, you know, good solar uh, options. You know, you've explored your carport, your backyard, your window awnings, and nowhere in your site has good solar because there are sites like that. And I, I, there's here's two photos of areas just in my neighborhood. Um, you know, one is you know the the this the the left hand photo is a house that has south facing roof, but across the street has a giant tree that covers the entire south window. Uh, so blocking their solar potential. And then on the right-hand photo is of a house that is just completely covered uh, on all sides by large trees. Um, so what are, if you have a property like this, what, what, what are your solar options? And, and the answer is community solar, which we'll get to in the next slide. So uh, Oregon's are one of the states with really fantastic community solar uh, policies. Um, not every state has policies that even allow community solar. Um, and then some that have a lot, some states that allow community solar have terrible policies. Uh, but Oregon's a really good state. Um, you, you, they're, they're, the, um, the way that Oregon does it is, um, you know, a developer can um, advertise a community solar system, and then they can start selling that solar system to uh, interested customers um, on a subscription basis. And that there's two options. One is based on capacity, and the other one is based on kilowatt hours. So you can either subscribe based on capacity. So capacity is equivalent to buying panels, uh, because capacity means like if you're bought you know, a 400 watt panel, let's say, you've bought 400 watts of capacity um, and some days it'll generate a lot of energy and other days it will generate not a lot. You know, it, it, you know, that's just how solar works. Or you can subscribe based on kilowatt hours of solar energy generated. Um, in no matter which way you do it, the whole point of this community solar stuff uh, is that the, the cost of energy generated from solar panels has fallen below the cost of electricity, re retail cost of electricity already today. And so the idea is that, well, if you, if you buy, let's say like, you know, you, you have this, um, uh, uh, the solar community solar array and you subscribe based on kilowatt hours. Well, maybe you'll subscribe it based at um, 10 cents a kilowatt hour of generated power. Well, right now, you know, Portland General Electric and Pacific Power, um, well, actually, Jan we're now into January. So now the cost of uh, retail electricity is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And so if you subscribe to the solar at 10 cents, well, you're getting a five cent, you know, kilowatt hour savings. Uh, and, and certainly, um, you know, there, there are small program administration fees that might make that margin a little bit smaller. But in general, um, Subscribing to community solar uh, will save you money um, and you get green electricity. Um, so, you know, it, it, the, the, the returns on investments is nowhere near necessarily as good as installing the panels on your own house's roof if you've got a really good roof uh, for it. 
But, you know, like I said, if you don't have a good roof, this is a is still a great option. Um, and so uh, if you want to find out more information about this, Oregon CSP.org is the place to find out more information about community solar. Um, uh, these program and administration fees are really for the um, the the uh, organization that has set up and built the panels. Um, it, it's very interesting that uh, Pacific Power, Portland General Electric, the utilities, um, to my knowledge, really allow this to happen without hardly any incurring any fees on their side. Uh, which is surprising to me. Um, maybe I missed something when I looked at or the documentations on OregonCSP.org, uh, but that was a very interesting to, to, to find that you know they basically allow virtual net metering by wire uh, with no fees on their end, just the administration fees for the uh, community solar, uh, in the, the person who actually installed the community solar to administer the program. Um, Next slide. And so um, a lot of these uh, large solar arrays, whether it be community solar um, or even utility scale solar, um, are built on the ground. And increasingly, you'll find that they're built on fixed racking. And the reason why that they're no longer, there's not a lot of effort to build um, solar on single or dual axis tractors is because solar panels have become so inexpensive that it's just better to install more solar panels than to uh, install tractors. And the reason is because the tractors are very expensive compared to the cost of solar panels today. Um, it didn't used to be that way. There you'll see you'll find older uh, installations of you know ground mounted solar that are installed on trackers. Um, but the modern day ground mounted solar are uh, by almost always not installed on trackers anymore because panels have gotten so inexpensive. Um, height off the ground. Um, if, if you don't need to worry about the agrivoltaics element, it's often the best to install the ground mounts as close to the ground as possible. Um, you know, you might have to have it be high enough so that the the low end the low side of this um, array is above the snow line. Um, but in general, the reason you want to get cl as close to the ground as possible is because as you get higher, there's more wind loads that you need to manage. And so then everything needs to be a bit beefier in order to handle the wind loads, which adds higher cost. Um, but once you add the agrivoltaics element into it, if you are if if this community solar or this ground mounted array needs to have the agrivoltaic element um, factored in, then sometimes the higher, the additional cost of putting the panels a little higher off the ground is more than offset by the uh, financial uh, benefits of the agriculture or the uh, farm, the, the to accommodate the farm animals and stuff. Um, and one of the things to, for sure, to think about is um, the cost of conductors and conduits um, when you're doing ground mounted solar options. Um, increasingly, um, the, the norm is to go as high voltage as possible. Um, most systems are, you know, 600 volts, getting close to 600 volts. Some are even getting close to a thousand volts uh, at DC. And that is so that they can use smaller conductors um, and have transmission efficiencies that are a little bit higher. And with those smaller conductors, they can use smaller conduits. Um, and all those things save money on the, um, what's it called, the hardware side of solar. And um, that that's all really great. And the reason why we can go to higher voltage DCs now is because inverters and MPPT controllers are all now able to handle these higher voltages. Whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was not the case. Uh, next slide. And so as we get to larger scales, um, you know, community utility scale, um, uh, increasingly there's a lot of interest in floating solar panels. And really the, 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 the 
interest in so floating solar panels is only half of it is related to the solar panel. The other half is, oh, well, we, we as a hydroelectric facility need to figure out how to reduce our evaporation off of our reservoir. And the reason why we need to figure out how to reduce evaporation off of the reservoir is because climate change is now reducing the amount of water coming into the reservoir. And, in, and with the increasing you know, higher temperatures, the evaporation is getting becoming more and more of a problem. And so, you know, the, uh, especially in the American Southwest, all those big hydroelectric dams, um, they're in, in recent years, they've seen the lowest levels on the reservoir they've ever recorded. And so by floating solar panels onto these reservoirs, um, they're able, they, they've done tests and found that it reduces the evaporation uh, off the reservoir by 60%. And not only do you gain the reduction in evaporation, which is kind of like the main thing, but the other thing is um, these solar panels, um, they are able to produce more energy than if they were just sitting you know, on a ground mount. Uh, because they're water cooled, and so uh, the 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 efficiency gains is about ten percent. Um, so all in all, um, it, there there are now multiple installations of large installations of floating solar panels um, that have been done. Here's one in New Jersey, um, and but uh, this there there's also some ecological benefits. Um, uh, the the water temperatures are reduced and they're finding re reductions in toxic algae. Um, but there's still more research that needs to be done on the ecological side. Like, you know, does this affect other ecosystem uh, life life processes like mayflies and stoneflies? Um, so uh, this is, I think, not a completely open and shut case yet. Um, but uh, I expect to see more of these arrays be installed and um, potentially these arrays will be community solar based and so you can buy shares or panels off of these arrays and have it be virtual net metered by wire to your account um, next slide edward we're um at 10 59 so um do you want to quickly do the next slide and then maybe answer one or two questions before wrapping sure, up? sure. next slide so I get the, the the one of the main questions if we're talking about solar beyond the roof and now you're thinking solar on your siding or your carport is stuff like that could you ever have too much solar and the answer right now is no um, there's no foreseeable problem of having too much solar especially when we, in the world of electrification where your heat heating goes from gas to heat pumps and your car goes from gas to being electric vehicle uh, both of those things will add huge amounts of uh, energy demand onto electric grid. And so we need more renewable energy generation. And we're nowhere close to having enough solar panels to uh, meet this demand. So no, we're not even close. Uh, next slide. I do, uh, and we'll answer some questions. And do you want to do it before we answer questions, do a plug on the next, uh, let's do a plug on the next one. So the next presentation in next month, we talk about utility scale, um, solar, um, more of the some of the history and the future utility scale. Um, I guess one of the things is is customer versus utility. If we're talking as in this presentation, you know, we're, we're, you're thinking solar on your roof or solar beyond the roof. Like it could very very well be possible that you're going to generate enough energy to be mostly energy independent. And so in that case, you know, where does the utility scale and utility scale solar or the utility utility fit into this? future of solar. Um, and then, you know, there's also a lot of interest in the uh, solar in the desert where there's tons of open space. But then um, I want to then share with you, okay, well, when you start factoring transmission, is it really such a good deal anymore? Um, so there's some, we'll run some numbers on that. And some of the other things like concentrated solar, the history and whether there's any future in concentrated solar Stuff like that will be in the next presentation. Uh, so yeah, we'll rewind to the question slide and um, answer some questions. Okay. Yeah, you just pick out whichever ones. Okay, uh, let's go from the top. Uh, tax credits based on a professional analysis of projected energy savings. Um, 
five dollars per square foot for 50 percent energy reduction what kind of engineer will perform the required analysis does this include solar um i don't i'm not familiar with the five dollars per square foot for 50 percent energy reduction uh requirement or target um so I don't know that I can answer that question very well. Um, certainly the engineer would be um, uh, some sort of like, usually like energy man managers, like uh, raters um, it would, would I think be the type of people. Um, sorry, I, I'm not able to fully answer that question. Uh, I will go to the next question. Do you recommend micro inverters, one per panel versus single system inverters? Uh, I don't recommend micro inverters, and the reason why I don't is because um, you end up having to do AC coupled batteries if you were to do any sort of AC coupling. And um, what's it called? There's there's a lot of basically you need a lot of inverters in order to make everything talk to each other. Versus if you um, go DC. There's a lot of much more cost-effective battery options. There are DC cars will be DC fast charged. And so like, um, you know, if you then convert from DC to AC, AC to DC, and there's just a lot of conversions that are unnecessary. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. But uh, power optimizers is what I would use instead. Um, there's a, two, or, at least two really good brands of power optimizers out there, and they'll do panel level uh, basically panel level and PPT. So that's kind of what you want. Um, well, what fraction of solar panels siding compared to properly sloped roof? I answered that already. Um, basically, it doesn't really matter um, because solar panels are so inexpensive compared to most siding that like, you know, you're basically cost parity with siding. Um, any vandalism with sidewalk solar panels? Uh, well, um, P bots 15 feet. So, you know, um, unless somebody brings a ladder with them, uh, it may not be that much of a problem. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I mean, Portland, it seems like in certain parts of Portland, anything will get vandalized. Um, so, uh, I don't think solar is an exception. Um, but I don't see that that is necessarily going to be the targeted as like more vandalized than something else um where do you see the most potential in the industry uh beyond solar uh beyond the roof and why um i i think solar is gonna it, it has or is going to get so inexpensive that um we're just going to see solar integrate into more and more stuff whether it be windows or siding, um, yeah, you know, and especially like, you know, like roof products, like, you know, it, it may be hard to see a future where like, you know, the, or even like the, 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 the shingles may not, like we may be seeing more solar shingles also. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of solar shingles because I think stepping on the, on the panels, um, when you're installing them is bad for the, the current technology um but that may change but uh for sure i think we're going to see a lot more solar siding we're going to see a lot more solar glazing uh certainly more people interested in like you know solar pergolas and solar carports and stuff like that we'll see a lot more of that stuff um a webinar is recorded uh it will be available um please comment on the engineering pole barn solar on the roof uh pole barns um it really depends i mean it's it's all based on loads and weights um and there i've heard yeah there are pole barns that you know can't handle solar on the roof because the um they they were already designed with such small margins for the weight that they can't handle the weight of the solar on the roof um I think it would not be difficult to um, beef up the solar, the, the pole barn structurally to be able to handle solar on the roof. Um, how exactly to do that? Um, you're going to have to refer to an engineer on how to beef up the 
solar, uh, the, the, the structural capacity of the roof. Um, I know in residential, um, it, uh, some of the like, not, not the non-trust roofs, the ones that have only rafters, um, the, those you have, you have to add like collar ties and um, some additional framing in order to beef up the, uh, uh, the strength of the roof to be able to handle solar. So uh, maybe the same case on pole barns. Uh, what is your recommendation regarding solar thermal? Uh, does it make sense, low cost of PV? Yeah, um, sorry, I, I might piss off some people by saying that solar thermal is dead, but I really think it is. I think with heat pumps, uh, it, it makes so much more sense to uh, install PV and then run a bunch of you know heat pumps off the electricity than it is to do solar thermal. The reason why is because like once you get the solar energy trans can convert to electricity. You can do anything you want with it. You can run anything electrically, and and that, the the versatility of that is just so much better than so what you can do with solar thermal. Um, so kind of that's my reasoning on that. Uh, any good examples of solar greenhouse using bifacial panels? Uh, I don't exactly have a example, um, but I I think it's a good idea. Um, so. Yeah, that's what I thought. Does the low ground solar panels have to be maintained or cleaned more often compared to the roof siding? Um, not really. Um, glass is surprisingly good at self-cleaning. Um, and if you're in the west side of the Cascades, we get enough rain that the rain kind of washes the solar panels for free for you. If you're on the east side of the Cascades, um, you know, it, it may require, um, you know, a hosing down um, some mid parts of the summer in order to get dust off of it. Um, but uh, yeah, solar panels are surprisingly good at keeping themselves clean. All right. It seems like that's all the questions. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to Grace. Um, do I? I don't know if my email was on any of the uh, slides, but if you don't have my email, reach out to Grace, and she can, uh, you know, forward questions to me if you have more questions. Yeah, and my email is grace at solaroregon.org. And you all will get an email in the next few days with the link to the YouTube video if you registered through the Eventbrite page. Okay, one more question. Yearly maintenance plans. Um, I, I think it's unnecessary for solar, um, but yearly maintenance plans is a good idea for heat pumps. Great. All right. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your Saturday. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.